Looks like we're live. Hello and welcome to Dive Into World Building. Sorry I was gone for a couple weeks there, but now I'm back and we're ready to talk about uh, domesticated animals. And, and, and just to start off the day, here is a domesticated animal that has decided to approach me. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. The other way is that you're the cat's domesticated animal. Well, you know, so so uh, we have this discussion, especially I think with cats. Do 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 people have this discussion about dogs? No, no. I don't think so. It's yeah. not the dog, um, well, I have dog, a dog; it owns me kind of thing, right? Dogs are dogs inherent are pack animals. animals. They have a hi social hierarchy. They acknowledge human beings as their masters. Cats do not, particularly in the wild. Not um, always, but yeah, I get your point. And they certainly do not acknowledge human beings as their masters. They acknowledge human beings as their servants. <laughs> people oh, tell dogs what to do. So, so let's, tell let's jump into um, evolutionary history for a second because, by, because I think it's really interesting to sort of um, talk about how these sort of relationships between humans and animals started to come about. And I don't... Um, you know, I'm not a, a deep, deep expert on this, but but what I have read suggests that uh, humans create a lot of garbage, <laughs> um, and animals start hanging around because they're interested in the garbage, and then there tends to be some interaction of various types, and over time we discover, hey, you know, it's kind of neat to have this animal around. Oh, hey, it's kind of neat to have this uh, human being around and, and so the interactions just get deeper and deeper over time and then you have cultural practice changing to incorporate these animals into aspects of life. Um, so there's been an article out just recently calling cats semi-domesticated rather than Domesticate, fully domesticated in the sense that dogs are. That was my understanding too that cats, um, because cats could simply go back to the wild. Like if every human being on earth disappeared tomorrow, cats would be relatively fine. Yeah. There would be a die off, but uh, they would just, they would go back to being what they were and they would be fine. And, and think about what you said of the early stages of, uh, when you think about it, because early humans would have discovered the usefulness of dogs as hunting assistants. Mm -hmm. So That's there's more cool. interaction there. Whereas the early usefulness of cats was as exterminating vermin around the yeah. camp. Right, right. Which cats, they can cats are pest control them. once you start um, storing grain. Um, yeah. Your problem with storing grain is plagues of mice. Um, yeah. What is the best thing to deal with plagues of mice? Cats. They will have turned up naturally, but people will have then gone, hey, that's really useful. We should try and make sure we do whatever is necessary to keep these things around so that they can help preserve our grain stores. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have that necessity to interact with the cats in order to, right. to get yeah. that service from them. Whereas if you're using dogs to assist in hunting, that's a lot more interaction. Right. The basis, the basis for the interaction is a lot stronger in the dogs, um, in the dog situation, for sure. I so, what were you saying? Oh, I, was, I just wanted to share this story that my husband told me. Um, he installs DirecTV for people, so he gets to go around to a lot of people's houses. And he learned recently that the Mennonites or the Amish have a particularly um, standoffish relationship with their pets. They don't really like bond with their pets like you or I do with their would with our cat. And they serve purposes like they don't. They and mentioned that there was one farm that had a collection of I believe it was chihuahuas. And they didn't feed the chihuahuas, but the chihuahuas were living there because they were living off the waste of the other animals. They were they were going around and cleaning up after like the horses and the and the other farm animals that they kept and they kind of like had this really complicated like symbiotic like you know uh, relationship between all these different creatures on their farm which that mm -hmm. is 
has this like really standoffish relationship with it. Because I think the culture I live in, I want to bond with my animals. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, I think a lot of a lot of um, people in our culture almost interact with their pets as though they're a stand-in. <laughs> What? It sounds like a blender. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, that's the um, that's the food processor. You should mute. I will mute that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Morgan. <laughs> um. Anyway, yeah. So I think that uh, a lot of us sort of coddle our pets and treat them like babies and that kind of thing. But I think that if you are in um, if you are in a situation where you have working animals, um. It's very different, or can be very different. You know, I mean, uh, I know some people who treat their horses with extreme fondness. But on the other hand, if your primary relationship with the animal is through a working relationship, then I think that the whole cultural aspect of that is going to be super different. Yeah, it's, it was really. I was so when he told me that story, I was like really trying to get into their head because like it was really hard for me to understand like how you could not just you know anthropomorphize your cat and like you yeah. know but I guess it would be necessary it would be necessary because if you're actually going to be having a close relationship with you know your food then I guess that would happen I don't well know. I mean yeah it's uh there's always this sort of Charlotte's Web uh, issue involved too uh where you might not want to become too fond of an animal that you're later going to have to eat. Uh, yeah. um, if, if, if eating the animals that you're raising is a big part of what you're doing in your lifestyle, that's going to have a really big influence on the kinds of emotional attachments, I guess, that you're going to be willing to make with those creatures. Well, yeah, you... Actually, when you, there's like three roles. There's domesticated animals as food. Uh -huh. There's domesticated animals as workers, and then there's pets. Uh huh. And uh, I grew up on a small ranch, so uh, knowing which calf was going to be next year's dinner was a normal thing for uh -huh. us. But then we had the chickens we raised for eggs. We had the sheep we raised for wool. Uh, and we had cats and dogs. Glenda, so, you and Brian got to that same point at the same time that there was wool <laughs> involved. Um, <laughs> silk is also an interesting one. Yeah. Because, I mean, you could argue that that, that that species is domesticated even though we don't it's not a mammal, so we don't really have an emotional relationship with it, <laughs> right? Yeah. They they um. actually I, I'm not sure if it, domestication is the right word, but they actually the silk moths cannot fly anymore. It's it's been bred out of them. So it's if not, human beings yeah. died tomorrow, the silk moths would all be eaten by something else, and they would be extinct. So yeah, that that domestic in the sense that they have become utterly reliant on human beings and not domestic in the sense that you can make them do tricks or whatever but there's a lot of animals yeah. that aren't particularly domestic in that sense. There's, there are really kind of two forms of domesticity now. There are actual pet animals. We now have a lot of people who keep pets, for com what they call exotic pets, which you know are not traditional animals with which we had a relationship. People have pet hedgehogs, pet skunks. Um, you know, th This is a very recent invention because we have um, develop this emotional attachment to pets um, yeah. completely separate from their utility. Mm -hmm. But up until probably the last hundred years or so, pretty much every instance of domestication was based on some form of utility, even if they then extended beyond that. Yeah. Yeah. And those exotic pets are tame, not domesticated. Right, right, so exactly. Where you have like a parrot, it's not domesticated. Yeah, and I think that that's a really Space. interesting thing to bring up, um, because domestication um, is a it is I think 
distinct from taming in it in as much as there is a component of co-evolution that's going on um, where there you know likely there are breeding programs uh, or at very least that there are these sort of accepted interactions and so it's going to have an influence on natural selection and what kinds of animals are um, best cared for and thus which uh, stay alive to pass on their traits, right? So um, there was a really interesting experiment done uh, recently and it was explored in the National Geographic where um, some folks in Russia decided to domesticate foxes. Oh, yeah. I saw that ages ago. Yeah. <laughs> and basically they created this deliberate breeding program that they ran over something like 50 years and they would deliberately separate the foxes that showed a particular affinity towards humans and interbreed them and then they would have the ones that showed aggression towards humans and they would interbreed them and they ended up with these two really different groups <laughs> of, of foxes and the ones that had been chosen for their ability to interact with humans ended up not only becoming basically like pets but they also became very um, they took on some other secondary characteristics like um, they, they developed spots yeah and curly tails and, and their yeah and their tails started curling and, and stuff like this it was really really interesting to see that when you started selecting for that, you got these other effects from that, you know, you'd think, well, that's not related at all. <laughs> but, I mean, there are a lot of spotted creatures that are domesticated, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to see what happened. Brian, thank you. The breeding program was started in 1959 by Dmitry Believ. Apparently so, yeah. They had a really great exploration of the whole thing in National Geographic. I, I highly recommend that you go look it up. Um, so it was very, very interesting. And then, of course, they ended up with these super ultra aggressive foxes, too. That <laughs> we didn't talk about those quite oh, as much. Very rage foxes. <laughs> positively inclined towards them. But, yeah. And it was actually astonishing how quickly the differences in both temperament and appearance showed up um, in these foxes. Anyway, it was pretty fascinating. I can't remember the details, but somewhere a long time ago I read about that a lot of domesticated animals that certain juvenile characteristics persist into mm. adulthood. Yeah. So th that, that's part of what was being selected for yeah. unintentionally. Well, yeah. And I think um, it does make sense, especially if you're dealing with an animal that's solitary when it grows up. Yeah. Right. Um, you wanted to... You wanted to... Um, yeah, it might have been in regard to cats specifically. I just don't remember. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's pretty interesting, though. Um, there are a couple of really interesting things uh, that are worth mentioning, one uh -huh. of which is that a lot of animals that we don't think of as being even close to being domesticated, and not just mammals, appreciate affection. Mm-hmm. For example, there's there's fish that love to be petted. Mm -hmm. It's a it's an amazing thing, you know. The the animal world, I mean, it's possible to anthropom anthropomorphize animal, but, but it's also possible to do the exact reverse. Assume that they're so different from us that they don't respond to the same things we do in the same way, and sometimes mm -hmm. they do. Brian, of course, was pointing out the the social behavior of uh, of dogs and cats being different. Yeah. And one of the things that, that happen with cats is, and one of the ways they've domesticated us is that they tend to meow to humans, not so much to each other, which I think is really fascinating. 
Yeah, that is. Well, and the other aspect to that is that they tend to meow right on the same frequency range that babies cry. Hardly a person, I'd say. Yeah. Oh my god, that is some programming for you. They know how to get right into your subconscious. <laughs> but if well, you can see the selection going on there. The cats that happen to meow and happen to meow at that particular frequency got better responses from humans. Right. Oh, exactly. <laughs> right, I think that's, that's co-evolution at the same time, yeah. Yeah. There aren't actually that many cats who can meow. I mean, of the large cat <laughs> families, most of them don't and can't. Uh -huh. I don't think that, you know, there's mostly just roaring and sort of other vocalizations. Um, well, roaring, okay, so in the, in the case of roaring, the big cats can and roar and the little cats can purr. Yeah, and it's the same. Oh. It's the same um, part of the throat that's used in either one. So you can't do both. Wait a second. Mm. Big cats can purr. Yeah. yeah. Well, cats some purr. cats that are large can purr. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. tigers, for example, can purr. No. Oh, okay. Well, so I, I could be, I could be not quite correct about that, but that was <laughs> the, um, that was the distinction that was sort of put forward to me at, at one point. We don't point, a lot of nature. Cats, but. <laughs> We don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> and, jaguars, like and by the way, when jaguars and tigers purr, it is loud. <laughs> I can believe that. Oh, bet, yeah. Well, I know that um, cougars, um, the mountain lions, can purr. Hmm. Wow. It's sort, of, okay. it's sort of startling to hear one. <laughs> Apparently, the uh, panthera cats, as opposed to felis cats, can only, for the most part, can only purr when exhaling, rather than whether inhaling or exhaling. The exception is the snow leopard, apparently. Well, there you go. Snow leopards purr. <laughs> you're, our, you're our man on Google, are you there, uh, Brian? <laughs> I'm afraid I am doing a little, little bit of... That's the joy of having oh, two screens. I can I can have you all up on one screen. Oh. I've got research going on here because I don't have enough books to my left on domestic animals. <laughs> <laughs> you know my bookshelf. You're the guy who in, always shows up with all the books. So there you go. I, I know. Like, in man, this I instance, to... I'm using this newfangled thing called the internet to find things out instead of books. I don't think it'll catch on, but apparently oh, it's an option. <laughs> where, where, where do you, Brian? Where do you find that internet? <laughs> I have it on. It's it's on a machine. It's on a box in my room. No, I'll look it up in Google. <laughs> that's why. I'll, that's how I'll find it. The internet. Where is the internet? It's a series of tubes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, so let's branch out a little bit. Um, dogs have been incredibly diversified in their body shapes, and. Their sizes and all kinds of different things based on what humans wanted to do with them, which is really quite fascinating. And Brian's saying plastic phenotype, yes, yeah. So, so you know, you look at these these dogs and they look really strange. But one of the things that I find fascinating is if you look into the history of the dogs, they're typically bred for a particular purpose. You know. Um, Terriers were bred to go down burrows, and in fact, kill rats. <laughs> terrier means burrow in French. So yeah, <laughs> and it I think right back to terra, that, probably. I believe that uh, dachshunds were also um, supposed to go badger to, hounds to burrows. Badger right? hound. Dachshund yeah. means badger hound. Yep. Badger hound. Oh, okay, yep. there you go. So, so they were short-legged enough to uh, to get down the badger burrows, but strong uh, in the the neck and shoulders, so they could actually you know grab on and fight a badger, which because badgers are fairly mean. Yeah, and they're wow. they've got long claws and they're yep. pretty tough. So yeah, so it is really really interesting, I think. Um, and I was doing a bunch of research because of this story that I'm writing on on wolves and how they're different from dogs. And I was looking at how big dogs are. Dogs can be really big. I mean, you, take a, you take a Great yeah. Dane and you stand it up. 
it is huge. Just Irish, Irish, enormous. Irish as tall as down, as tall as Raj, probably. Oh yeah. <laughs> so so there is that. Um, I've seen some Afghan hounds once that were. I mean, they're not particularly heavy bodied, but they're huge, tall, yeah, very long. tall. Um, yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of very large um, varieties and very small varieties, and it just depends, you know, whether this dog was intended to follow horses or or fight with wolves or, you know, um, yeah. It's interesting to consider if people have the same kind of variations in size, that same level of variations. Yeah. Yeah. I'm writing that down. That's going to give me some kind of <laughs> idea. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking about the comments about herding in the sidebar. That because a pack of dogs would could surround a group of of mm -hmm. herbivores to uh, hunt. Right. Yeah, and so you can have that behavior modified into herding. Yeah. It, okay, what were yeah. you saying? They, it's like toned down hunting behaviors that are translated to to working. Animals. Yeah, if, if, yeah, if you've ever seen working sheepdogs, we used to, back when I lived in the UK, we actually had a, a program, a television program, televised competitive sheep herding. I'm not kidding. It's called one man and his dog. And you would you would watch and basically there was a shepherd and there would be either one dog or in some instances two dogs, it depends on the type of competition they were doing. And they had to achieve certain things. Um, and a lot of these things, if you have a look at it, it's exactly what dogs would have done when hunting. Um, spurting out a single sheep from the pack. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's exactly based on the fact that you try and isolate one individual that you think is weak and that you're going to take down away from the rest of the pack which might try and defend it and might try and hurt you. Uh, hurt you. Right. So that, you know, all the things that, that um, border collies, it's all border collies because they are the smartest, they're scarily intelligent dogs. Um, yeah. They are using, they have been trained and expanded on those natural hunting instincts and they're all used to deal with herding sheep. So it is, it's the hunting uh, instinct to do it. Yep. Hi. So, um, who knows? Um, who knows the difference between sight hounds and I, I believe it's scent hounds. Scent hounds. Sight hounds hunt through line of sight. Yeah. Things like greyhounds, things that go after rabbits. Yeah, they, so they go super fast and chase stuff and just yeah. tear it down. Like they're, they're the cheaters of the dog world. <laughs> yeah. Scent, scent and then hounds, the scent hounds like are slower. Hound will track they... beagles, scent, um, bloodhounds, they, they track through forest for like long distances. So they're the ones that the word dogged comes from. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Um, it's kind of interesting to think about distinctions like that if you're going to be working in a, in a secondary world and you want to try to think about, you know, oh, we've got these hunting animals, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's helpful to sort of say, well, what is the basis of their hunting behaviors? Um, and I also think that it's helpful to take, to, to consider evolutionary factors and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so right now I'm working on this story, which is the sequel to Cold Words, which I mentioned in my in my little label down there. Um, and so one of the things that I did when I was creating the language for this story was I said, well, okay, why would wolf-like creatures talk? And how would they talk? And... So, so what I did was I said, okay, well, they're going to talk so that they can coordinate their hunts better. Yeah. Um, and then I also said, well, if they're going to talk and they're running at the same time, they're going to want to start each utterance with some kind of sound that says, hey, look at me. I'm about to talk to you because, 
if you're running really fast and you're busy doing something, unless you've had the attention getting device first, you might not actually hear what they were saying to you. Um, and that was how I designed the, the cold words, which basically every utterance uh, starts with a little um, reduplicated call that suggests the kind of utterance that is going to follow it. So um, for something like, I'm going to be humble to you, they say, bell belly, and then they go in and say their humble thing. Or they'll say, bow bow, and then they'll tell you to do something. Right? Um, it changed the way, I mean, the fun part about it was, was they're kind of wacky and very bark-like, but at the same time, people could totally get why it was in the story. And, and people were like, yeah, yeah, that's totally, you know, that's totally working for me because I can totally see why they would be doing it that way. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure that it has to do necessarily so much with domestication, but if you're talking about animals in general, t talking, thinking through evolutionary histories, and, and in, in our case of the domesticated animals, co-evolutionary histories, I think would be very, very useful. Um, so let's move on to what we're talking about in the sidebar here. Um, New World has no domesticable animals that can be used to pull a plow or, or to ride. Well, it used to. They could have, they could have used dinosaurs. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. Well, um, they can't well, they last last on, on, damn it. In North America, they just died out. Yeah, they well, may, they may have been usable megafauna, but people killed them before they had um, adapted to using them. Uh, yeah. I like the idea of, of giant six-foot armadillos being used to pull a plow. That would be so cool. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine two giant armadillos yoked together and pulling a plow? <laughs> Come on, you know you want to. You want to write this. <laughs> Oh my god. Mega, mega like, maybe not ago. mastodons, but oh my god, that would have been so awesome. <laughs> oh, humans are so disappointing. Well, so they had um they did use dogs. Yeah, but dogs aren't big enough to pull well, they're plows. Not pulling plows, but they were able to pull um they were able to pull uh like cargo boy. Uh, cargo things. It, like Travoy. You know, yeah, but not enough. Fledges, there we go. It's <laughs> like cargo uh, things. <laughs> it's a technical term. Tavoie. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, try getting them to do anything. <laughs> well, and so, okay, so um, let's move away from the dire wolves. And so, but, but like, so, okay, so let's look at llamas for a second. Yeah. Um... Llamas are, are really quite fascinating um, because they can climb steps. And, was, it, was it you that just posted that the, yesterday on Facebook? Somebody was talking about the, the Incan roads and how the llamas dominated because they could climb steps and when the Spaniards came in with the horses of course, the horses couldn't deal with the Incan roads. And I didn't know yeah, well, didn't climb um, I, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me, Glenda. But um, but I've had conversations about this in, in particular because um, Janice Hardy, my friend, was was setting a story in a sort of Incan-inspired setting. And one of the things, I mean, so so let's just say that. A particular choice of domesticated animal can really vastly change what the entire culture looks like. Yeah. Because if you've got a lot of really steep hills and you've got an animal that can climb steps, then there really isn't any need for wheels. Yeah. Right? Because, I mean, all you're going to end up having is something that goes clattering down the hill the minute you leave it alone, right? Yeah. So you could try using uh, round things for other purposes, perhaps, you know, gears or, or, or whatever, pulleys, etc. But sticking a cart on wheels isn't going to be your big thing because it's terribly impractical and you have this domesticated animal that can take up the slack. 
Are you going to talk about weaving, Brian? Not specifically, but um, it does relate. I mean, that your solutions to problems are based on the tools you have available, and that does include your domestic animals. So the new world solutions to problems were utterly different than the old world solutions to problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. People would approach things in different ways. Um, brute force was not usually an a new world option because you didn't have the extra power of animals and so forth. Um, you didn't therefore move on from that to use things like the plow and the wheel because in order to use the plow and the wheel you need power and that power wasn't available. Right. But instead of you know coming up with those solutions they had all sorts of interesting solutions to uh, um, environmental problems and they basically revolved around weaving um, and you know whether it was wool or whether it was grasses. Yeah. Like rope bridges. Absolutely. Yep. Um, you need to bridge you need to bridge um, a chasm. You don't build a massive great stone construction because it's much harder for you to move all that stone around without carts and so forth. It can be done. There right. are places in South America where it certainly has been done. But in general, um, yeah, you might want to build a wall or a fortress out of stone, but you don't need to build a bridge out of stone. You can build a bridge out of grass or uh, hair. You just yeah. need a lot of grass or hair and you just wind the, that stuff and it gets thicker and thicker and you do cabling and so forth and there are, you know, bridges there that are 1500 years old. Yeah. Well, and, and there's a lot of, in, this is going afield, but the, the kipus were originally thought to be just accounting devices and there's beginning to believe now that there, it was a pretty advanced language Mm. Bots. But of course, so little of it has been preserved. Right. Which again is is because, and again, like you say, the llamas and alpacas had the fur, and that was available to them. Right. And that affected their method of of uh, how they derived record keeping. Right. Right. So, so what about um? Let's talk about oxen or cows and and stuff. Was there? I'm just wondering. You know, are there um a lot of? I mean, they're buffalo, right? In in the New World. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. Well. There's Buffalo. bison in the New World. Sorry, There's bison, no yeah. buffalo, there, there we go. Strictly yeah. speaking. Buffalo is the water buffalo or cape buffalo. Um, water yeah. buffalo are domesticable. Um, yeah. Bison, not so much. No. Okay. No. No. You know they the are mean. You know what the scientific name for bison is? Nope. Aren't they bison, bison? Yes, it's, bi it's three times. Bison, bison, bison. Oh, that's a subspecies. <laughs> No, you're you getting American tired. one? That's okay. I, I can match that. There. Guess what? The uh, has the Latin name Puffinus Puffinus. <laughs> Puffin. No. No. Ha -ha. No. Puffin is Fraticula arctica. Puffinus Puffinus is the Manx shearwater. So never trust oh, the Latin names. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I know. Yeah. <laughs> they thought the puffins looked like little monks. Apparently. They did. Fraticular Arctic means little friar of the north. Little friar, oh my god, that's so cute. Oh my god, I'm like thinking to be cuter. Oh my god. <laughs> but of course, talking about Arctic suddenly made me think of reindeer. Oh yes, let's talk about reindeer. Those are domesticatable. Yeah. They are. They're not as mean as bison. <laughs> No, the uh, the laps have got um, plenty of domesticated reindeer, and caribou is, as far as I'm aware, the same species. It what's is. The, um, what's the other name? Um, what's their What's their tribal name? Let's see. It's not laps. The Sami. Sami. There we go. Thank you. I wanted to use that word. Um, yeah. So that is a fascinating system to look up. Um, people don't typically ride. Reindeer, even though there's a lot of that in movies. Um, I mean, they can small. ride them, but it's not like they're used for for riding all the time. They're too small. I yeah. 
they're not huge. And, and I think there's something physiological about how the shoulders and spine and hips are constructed that, af that affects which animals are good at carrying heavy loads and which aren't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sure that that's got to be true because not everything can carry the same amount of weight. Yeah. And I'm sure that, that we've, I mean, if you look at um, some of the types of horses that have been bred, We've had our fingers in the in the <laughs> in there as well to make sure that pe that these creatures are capable of of doing what we need them to do. I mean, if you look at Belgian draft horses versus yes, exactly, ra uh, racing horses um, versus ponies. Wow, Brian, are you going to tell us about that, or are you just going to leave it in the oh sidebar? So <laughs> seriously. Wow. It's it's gross, it's true. Uh. Um, it's, it's a reindeer thing. Um, I don't know if it's been done with other animals, but it was certainly done um, with reindeer. Um, and I don't ask me who found this out as well, because you always wonder with these sorts of things, who first decided that <laughs> instead of directly eating hallucinogenic mushrooms which might be poisonous and make you sick, what you would do is you would let the reindeer eat the hallucinogenic mushrooms, and they would process some of the toxins out, um, and then you would drink the reindeer urine, and you would just get a, a dose of the necessary hallucinogenics without some of the nasty stuff. Well, and apparently that is, that's a thing. That is but yes, who, who first came up with the idea and went like, I tell you what would be really awesome is if I drank reindeer urine now. <laughs> Just, what could just possibly go wrong? I don't know. I don't know how people decide to come up. That's like that coffee that some kind of little animal eats the coffee beans and then yeah, use the yeah. poop to make coffee. Apparently, they wash that first, though. You're not actually eating civet poo. Okay. <laughs> but they yeah, just, I, get the I, beans my, out. My guess with the reindeer thing is that long ago, somewhere up in the, the far frozen north, somebody lost a bet. Yeah. <laughs> well, you or know, somebody was and they discovered a cool water. side effect from it. Someone was or they, or they no just did accidentally. <laughs> I mean, it could have been like one of those things where it was like yellow snow and nobody really noticed and they just melted it down. <laughs> that too. Right, and then everybody got high, and they were like, "What was that, man? Look at that snow, dude! Oh my I God, it was the snow!" <laughs> oh my God, this has gone very weird. <laughs> Caribou's nice. <laughs> There's all new meanings of caribou coffee. <laughs> I have now been replaced by a domestic animal. <laughs> <laughs> and a tortoiseshell one at that. For certain values of domestic with this one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, absolutely. So, um, what else? I mean, I think that there are more things that we could talk about, but I'm not sure. Um, we we totally wandered off from the oxen. <laughs> yeah, we, I, you know, I was I was hoping we could engage with the question of oxen. Um, they're really slow, but gosh, you know, if you go to Colonial Williamsburg, you can see you can see them. They've got these um, historical breeds of animals at Colonial Williamsburg, and one of the things that they have is they've got this fabulous cart. Pulled by these amazing looking oxen. So cool. Um, let's see if I can actually find a picture of it. Um, because I remember seeing them and kind of going, whoa. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So um, well, and that's like the um, crossing the the plains in America. The settlers, you know, you it, the covered wagons were oxen, ox carts. Yeah, yeah, they were. Horses, people I think it's horses, but ox can haul more. 
Very powerful. Oh, Slow, like, but very powerful. Five miles in a day, practically. Yeah. Perfectly slow. I'm trying to see if there's a way that I can show you this picture without actually um, having to have you go and look at it yourselves. There is some kind of split screen function or something. Let me see if I can do this. I'm going to see if I can master the technology. <laughs> <laughs> screen share, maybe? That's what I was thinking. Um, um, sure. all, the, all the Europeans brought all the animals. They took them with them uh, when they would come. Can you see when they this, you guys? Yeah, because we were so so reliant on them. That's how you know all pre-industrial technology was pretty much all animal driven. So damn right, yeah. people. Brought them. You you go into the new world. You want to plow. You bring your oxen. Okay. Yeah. Well, so did you guys see what I put up? No, but I think Len is right. I think it's the screen share function you need. No, I can't see it, but I did go click. I did go look at the link. Okay. Well. Uh, you have it on your screen. I have it in the showcase, but I'm not able to get it to to show up for you guys. So the link was fine. Yeah. That's fine. So if you want to go see it, you can follow the link. And I'm, I wish I could bring it up on the screen so people who are like watching the video later could actually see it. Yeah. But oh well, I'll put it in my report and then they can they see it on my reports. <laughs> so. Ooh. Brian has book references. Books? Mm. Me? That almost never happens. No. Okay, Charles Mann, 1491 and 1493. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Oh, yes. I highly recommend those. Yes, absolutely. Totally read those. Yep. Enormously yeah. useful for world building. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And very interesting on their own account. But, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, good. I got it. What? Oh no, Rye! Uh huh. Got it to work. Be smart. Oh my god, and you can make it bigger. Oh my god, wow. Cool. Awesome. Well, later, later, Rye, you'll have to uh, have to show me how I can. Uh... Nice. Oh, <laughs> a tutorial, <laughs> of course. Yeah, so we lost the picture, and now we're seeing the tutorial. <laughs> oh, my God, I can see myself looking at myself. Oh, my God, that's so funny. Give me off. Give me off. Why am I big? Hang out. Yeah, he's gotten surreal. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Another neat book that's relates to the North American and the, the animals. Let me run in the other room and grab it because I don't remember the title. Okay. I'm, I'm sitting here racking my brain to see, see if I can think of any other genre of animal that has been uh, domesticated in some sense. A uh, ferrets. Yeah, <laughs> ferrets. Really? Geese. Another, another weird Watch cat. geese. Oh, geese. Geese and ducks oh, and some, chickens. Somebody also mentioned camels. Both camels have been domesticated. Yeah. Oh, Elephants. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is The Eternal Frontier, Glenda? Yeah, by uh, Tim Flannery. Cool. It's um, an ecological history of North America and its peoples. Oh, that sounds fascinating. Thanks for recommending it. Oh, my God. How thick is that? It's a doorstopper, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's not that thick. Okay. Like, I never make it to the end of nonfiction, ever. You know what? It's readable. It's not. <laughs> okay. Okay. Some, some nonfiction is written just wonderfully. <laughs> <laughs> and some fiction like isn't. <laughs> yes, and some fiction isn't. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's all about the quality of the writing, not so much about uh, the content, I suppose. Um, 
Well, I, I'm actually going to say maybe we should wrap up. Are there other thoughts that you guys wanted to share before we go? Have we domesticated fish? I mean, I suppose we farm fish. Farm fish, but no, there's not. I, no. Well, because we don't do anything in the water. Like, you know, you don't like harnessing teams of dolphins to pull your boat. Oh, I mean, apart, we do apart sort from of those places where there are um, pools where you um, let your feet in the water and the fish will nibble away and eat off dead skin. and. Yeah, but they would do that anyway. <laughs> like... I mean, they would, but they would do that for anything too. They would do that for other fish. They would do that to anything in the water. Yeah. They're well, not. But they've know, been so they've been domesticated in the sense that they are not afraid of humans. That's true. That's true. So there's that level of of tameness. Yeah. <laughs> dead, eating dead skin off your feet. <laughs> It would be interesting to have a culture domesticate something aquatic. Yeah. It's, it's cool. time for the pet octopus. They're very intelligent. Yes. They can be taught yeah. to do all sorts of things. I think, you know, the pet octopus is an idea whose time has come. Oh, my God, I wish. That's exactly where my thought went. Yeah, and you know what? There's also, there's also we have, you know, we're, all those trained dolphins and, and orcas... Yeah. And sea, sea lion. But yeah. Blackfish, like, didn't Blackfish, the whole movie was about how they couldn't domesticate the the um, whale and how miserable it was and it was, you know, like... Well, yeah, so maybe they're miserable. That's true. Because, I mean, <laughs> as we said earlier, it's, it's worth asking the question because domestication and taming are not the same. Yeah. Um, you know, and keeping an animal in captivity is one thing. Domesticating it is a completely different thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I think that's definitely. A, I'm just the Debbie Downer here, I'm just bringing up how all the animals are miserable. And <laughs> I don't think humans would be very um, easily domesticable. Probably not. I mean, because we we tend we tend to like to be the ones doing the domesticating rather than rather than being domesticated. Well, I've got a story floating in my head in which sci-fi end up kind of being pets and kind of not sure how they feel about that. <laughs> what is that? Okay, okay, that I want to say Forbidden Planet, but I don't. That's not right. But no, nope. it was that whacked out 1960s cartoon where like human beings were little tiny pets for like these big aliens, and then the little tiny humans rebelled. Does, mm. Am I anyway? Ooh. No. Who ever saw that? Oh my god. There was, there was a song about it by a band called Porno for Pyros called Pets. Okay. <laughs> but, but I don't remember the name of the movie. <laughs> I know the song. Let's see if I can find out what the movie was. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic Ooh. Planet as opposed Fantast to Forbidden. Okay, I was Fantastic close. Fantastic Planet? Yeah, and um, yeah, and like, cause humans are only like they're like three inches tall compared to these aliens. They keep them as like little pets, and like, there's this one where like they have two women and their hair is tied together, and they just put them down and they fight, and they and they laugh. It's like this little game of like these little fighting women. Um, wow. Ooh. It's, yeah. It's, it's a weird movie. I think I was too young when I saw it. I don't know. My parents <laughs> let me watch it, though. So, I mean, I should talk about my parents on YouTube, though. <laughs> that could happen. <laughs> okay, so, um, well, so I guess we're wrapping it up. Let me um, let you know. We have a guest author next week. Uh, so there won't be any hangout on Wednesday. The hangout is going to be on Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific. So... Um, be aware, I will also announce as the day gets closer, and I'm going to be better about it, because this week I was on the fence about whether we were going to do this, but you guys are obviously awesome enough to show up, so I totally appreciate it. Um, we are going to be having as our guest, Malin, um, Lewis, <laughs> sorry, Malin Lewis, who, um, who wrote a really terrific story in Shimmer called The Half Dark Promise, and that uh, may, uh, some of you may have read it. Um, 
he's got this fascinating world that he's putting together and I'm going to be doing uh, some reading on, in other places in his world over the course of this week and it's going to be really really cool to talk to him so that will be Thursday at 4 p.m. and uh, hope that you guys can make it and I'm going to stop the broadcast thanks everyone <laughs>